Welcome to the Business Extra. I'm Mustafa Al Rawi, the National's Assistant Editor in Chief. Today, we're going to be talking about gender balance and how it can improve the economies of the Middle East, North Africa, and beyond. I'll be talking in a moment with Samar Esmat from the IFC. But before I do that, please do subscribe and if you like this show. And of course, if you're on YouTube, ring that bell. Well, as I said, joining us today uh, to talk about the effects and the impact um, on economies in this region of greater gender balance is Samar Esmat from the IFC, who's the gender lead for Middle East, uh, Central Asia, and Turkey. Uh, Samar, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me, Mustafa. It's a pleasure to be with you. For the IFC, which you know is a, a multilateral organization, helps with funding, um, in very, very deeply involved in, in the Middle East, South Africa, as well as other regions. And we met you and I the first time when um, uh, I was at the, uh, the She Wins uh, 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 initiative launch at the World Government Summit, which was the IFC supporting women-led startups across the region which is quite an amazing initiative, really. And, and I was really impressed um, by the, the kind of scale of the project, but also uh, the talented uh, people who were there really solving problems and making things happen um, across the region. Um, and, and so, you know, to come around to, to, to a shorter question for you, Summer, um, you know, what is the IFC doing in terms of gender? What are you doing? How do you see the big picture at the moment? I mean, the big picture, and it's, it's great, it's a great play, place to start from, is that, you know, achieving or improving gender balance in the Middle East and North Africa region is incredibly important for this region economically. And that is, that is uh, because, you know, the Middle East and North Africa region really stands to increase its annual GDP by um, a very large um, 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 2.7 trillion US dollars in additional GDP if we were all able to increase or improve gender balance um, in our region. And I want to repeat that number to our listeners because it's quite staggering. That is $2.7 trillion in additional gross domestic product for this region, just by closing gaps between men and women's economic participation in this region. So, and think about it, Mustafa, you know, women do represent half, roughly half of the region's population. And in many of the Arab countries in this region, they actually represent half of university graduates. But when you look at the number of their participation in the labor force, it's quite depressing. Only 20% of those who could work actually work. When you look at men, 70% of men who could work actually in this region are working. So, I mean, we're really missing out on, um, uh, you know, a huge potential contribution from these women in terms of innovation, in terms of new perspectives, jobs that this region desperately needs. Um, so really to answer your question, you know, we're working on this because it's it's vital actually for, for our region. It's critical to a resilient, a sustainable, um, and mostly inclusive economic recovery for this region in the aftermath and of the pandemic and the ongoing economic crises that we're all navigating. That number is really, really big. And, and obviously, we're leaving a lot on the table by not closing the gender gap. And, and the World Economic Forum puts out a study every year. And I think given the, the, the problems of the pandemic and, and how it um, uh, hit women harder than men, that we kind of that that gap has grown bigger in terms of of, of the amount of time. It's well over a century, sadly, um, before we can do that. But but what I want to pick up on is is really from everything you were just saying, um, and and maybe I'm always a glass is half full kind of person. But it seems to me that we can actually make headway and progress on a lot of the problems in this region by uh, addressing the gender gap. If we are able to get more women into the workforce, more women led companies. Um, to kind of inc improve that economic activity, all those things that you mentioned, the importance of it, we can actually resolve a lot of societal issues across the region through gen through the gen gender parity, gender balance uh, prism, if you like. Is that fair? Absolutely. You know, and um, I want to get to that in a moment where there are very powerful examples of you know female founded and female led startups from within this region who have put on the table very powerful solutions to our region's most pressing challenges. 
But, you know, I, I get asked a lot, okay, so you guys want to support women, um, women's economic participation, specifically female, female founded and female, female led startups. But what is it that you really want to do? And, and, and why is it that you want to do that specific thing? And I, I want to, if you, if you allow me, I want to sure. explain that a little bit. Um, and, you know, um, I mean, you know that, I know that, you know, the World Cup is about, upon us. I'm a big football enthusiast. So I'm allow me to use a, a football analogy just in case we have some football uh, fans among, among, our, among our listeners today. So because I get asked this question so often, I like to use the analogy of a, a, a soccer field. And so I'd like everyone to think of the startup scene in the Middle East, but beyond as a football pitch. And really, I want to think people of startups as football players. And what they're really doing is they're trying to advance um, and grow their startups, really, past their competitors on the pitch. And they really want to shoot their shot so they can land um, you know, a goal. And by, by landing a goal, that's a metaphor for really for landing some investment uh, from, from an investor. And so you have male and female startup founders on that pitch, and they're all shooting for the same investors. Now, here's the thing. The thing is that that pitch is not even, it's not balanced, right? And um, it's it's really skewed and it's it's skewed not in favor uh, for women. Um, it's actually skewed against them. So it makes it harder for female startup founders to advance to the finish line and shoot their shot and, and land that investment deal. Um, and I, I want to back that up with some data. So we actually conducted a study here at the IFC in, in 2019 where we found that only 6% of funding that was channeled to startups in the Middle East and North Africa went to female founders. So think about that. 94% of financing that goes to startup goes to male founders. Um, and so there's a real big skewing there going on. And, and um, the skewing is really a result of, of biases, and inherent biases in what I call the three Cs. It boils down to the three Cs. Uh, in the startup world. It's about confidence to pitch your business. It's about connections to investors or customers to grow your business. And it's about capital that you need. And so what we're trying to do, and I think that's where it really boils down to, is we're trying to really, really take out that bias. We want to build the confidence of female founders to communicate and negotiate their businesses. And we want to see generally more women in, you know, uh, um, uh, STEM education, you know, which which stands for um, technology, math, and, and 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 so forth, because that's a pathway to founding a tech powered startup, which is what you need to found a st find found a startup in, in in today's day and age. By the way, you know, those few women who know the tech side of startup uh, um, uh, uh, creation, um, you know, they they have they lack the skills uh, to run and, and grow a business. So the first C is Take out the bias in the confidence game. The second C is connections. We want, uh, you know, women to be able to, to be better at making connections. So we know they face challenges to move around in the business space, to make the connections and customers, uh, connections to customers, investors. They need to grow their business. And that's due to a whole bunch of things. You know, it could be simple things, moving from A to B, taking a bus or a taxi. Or it could also be, you know, cultural issues. It's not appropriate to go and attend an evening meeting with an investor, things like that. Or they might just not have the time. You know, they're looking, they're primary caregivers of their family and looking after their children. So there is a bias there and, and we're trying to address that. And the third C where we see a bias is capital. And so that's about accessing financing. And because they don't know how to network uh, with investors, they're not visible in the same way to the investors um, that, for instance, male startups would be, um, uh, we, we see that oftentimes female startup founders get overlooked or dismissed by investors uh, because of that. And so in order to kind of, you know, make the pitch, so to say, going back to the football analogy, make it make it more even, um, we need to address those biases. And that's why we launched the She Wants Arabia initiative that you spoke uh, um, about earlier. And it really aims to channel fi financing, but also support to female entrepreneurs in the Middle East to specifically address those these biases. I mean, you talk about the three C's as confidence, connections, capital, and you know, the men are historically, traditionally in this region encouraged um, to go after the three C's. Um, while perhaps for women, they don't have the opportunity to take those risks because it's a risk to start your own business, to try and make something succeed from nothing. 
And and one thing I did hear at the She Wins Arabia uh, conference when 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 I met you and your other IFC colleagues was that actually women tend to be able to enable men to take risks and 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 to kind of help women to get on the field of play in the first place what men can do is enable the women in their families or their lives to to actually be, have the chance to take the risk if that's what they want absolutely and you know it boils down at the end of the day it boils down to choice and um, equal opportunity you know and so i think that in my view is what leveling the playing field or the pitch um i keep coming back to the soccer terminology i'm too excited about the world cup that's what it's about in my mind and you asked me a really important question in the beginning you said to me you know um there, there, there is a great potential out there for these overlooked female startup founders to solve serious challenges uh, and problems for a region. And, you know, I would imagine that, you know, our listeners might be nodding their heads and thinking, yeah, in, in principle, yes, but what would that look like in reality? And I have a few really interesting examples that I think would be really interesting to share. Um, and though they come from the first round of our She Wins Arabia initiative. And, and you saw many of those female startup founders, Mustafa, um, at, uh, at Dubai Expo last year. So uh, we, we had with us 50, 50 out of 77 um, inspiring female startup founders that came from 10 Arab, Arab countries. And there are three examples that I find so incredibly inspiring because they really solve the big problems in our region. And, you know, I find it so sad that just by overlooking these female founders, that we miss an opportunity uh, of of bringing value to 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 our to our region. So one that comes to mind is a Tunisian startup founder called Sabrine Shinewi, and she founded a green tech startup that converts toxic waste from cooking oil and ash into chemical free cleaning products. And that's fine. I find that very powerful, and I find that particularly powerful because that is not the type of business that you would typically associate with a female, you know, uh, business owner or entrepreneur. We tend to think of them as active in specific spaces around fashion or maybe food catering or a lifestyle. So it's a very powerful example of a green tech. Um, another example that comes to mind is uh, Dina Schumann, who's Jordanian and who co-founded a startup that's based over at yours in, in the UAE. And that startup is building um, um, the financial literacy of, of young children in the Arab region, solving for how do you create the next generation of financially uh, savvy and, and responsible um, Arabs, so to say. And then and then last, um, an example that I find very, very powerful is from um, another Tunisian female startup founder who founded a startup in Tunisia that connects small and medium-sized businesses with potential investors. So businesses want to be bought up, investors want to buy them and uh, invest in them. And how do you connect them, especially if these are smaller types of businesses? So her platform really solves for that equation, difficult equation. Again, it solves for a problem. And so that's to say that these are incredibly smart business ideas, quite competitive, actually, very compelling, um, solving real problems in the market. But we must find, we must find a way to find them, look for them, shed light on them. And that's what we're really trying to do. So building on the success of She Wins Arabia's first round in 21-22, we launched, just launched the second round. And it targets more uh, women and covers more markets. And, you know, I can share more if you're interested. Yeah, go for it. Go for it, Summer. <laughs> so she wants the second round of She Wants Arabia um, uh, was launched because there was so much success in She Wants Arabia 1. We only initially went uh, for 50 uh, female startups, uh, but actually ended up reaching 77. And there was so much more potential to reach more women to cover more, more, more geographic ground. So we launched a second round just now, actually. Um, and our partner this time around is the UAE's World Government Summit. Um, we're again partnering with the Kingdom of the Netherlands, who are, are, are uh, generously supporting this initiative. And so in the second round of She Wins Arabia, we're actually supporting 100 female-led startups. Um, and that's doubling the number. Um, and we're also going to many more Arab countries. We initially covered only 10. This time around, we're covering 20 Arab countries, so almost the entire Arab region. And we include this time around, you know, all of the GCC, but also difficult places like uh, West Bank and Gaza and Yemen. And we're even inviting Syrian uh, female startup founders who may be based outside of the country to participate. So I'm really excited about the second round. And I think we have a real momentum going. 
So what do the uh, prospective uh, startups that might get into the program, what do they get out of it? Um, again, so the, 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 the idea of She Wants Arabia is to provide the support that female startups need to grow, right? And that support could be financial or non-financial. So it could be direct investment, but it could also be mentoring and coaching and, and capacity building and networking. Um, and so we continue to do that. We're placing a stronger emphasis this time around on facilitating investment. That, that was a strong ask uh, uh, for, from the last round. Um, and in essence, and that's how I have been talking about She Wins Arabia, in essence, it's about shedding light on those otherwise overlooked female startup founders that have great growth potential, but are just not being seen by the ecosystem. So it, it's, I guess, coming back full circle to what we were talking about at the beginning, which is closing that gap, you know, helping with um, bringing about balance in terms of the startup scene between genders. And again, I, I think, you know, we'll wrap up here, Summer, but I'll say that why this matters is because it's not just about opportunity for a few hundred um, women-led startups. It's also the impact that they will make on the region, it, not just economically, but it, but societally. And, you know, we need momentum going forward. And that's going to come from the grassroots. It's going to come from brilliant people like this getting support from the IFC. So I guess uh, the, the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, Summer, is looking forward, what are your hopes for, for women-led startups in the region if we go into 2023? Absolutely. So, you know, Mustafa, I, we all consider She Wins Arabia to be a journey, and it's the, it's the beginning of a journey that needs to continue. And so we, we think of it as what next and what more needs to be done. And I think we have a lot of work ahead of us if we want to play at a level that so-called playing field for female startups. We absolutely need to continue to raise awareness about their potential. Um, we need to build their capacity and improve their connections, but also work with ecosystem players like venture capital funds, investors, accelerators, to help them understand the specific challenges that these female founders face, but also help them appreciate the potential that they have, you know, the business potential they bring to the table. Um, but more importantly, and I say that from a place um, uh, of being an institutional investor, we also need to invest more through a gender lens. We as institutional investors need to invest in funds and accelerators that support female founders, but they in turn also need to invest more through a gender lens. And I think that's, that's the key word here. Follow with investment and, and follow through with uh, providing that that much needed capital for these female, female founders. Uh, Samar Asmad, thank you so much for being with us today. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Mustafa. Well, that's all we've got time for. If you like this show, once again, I'll ask you to subscribe. All that remains to thank our production team and join us again next time.